Hello and welcome to the Apologetics 315 podcast with your hosts, Brian Auten and Chad Gross. Join us for conversations and interviews on the topics of apologetics, evangelism, and the Christian worldview. Try to understand, this is a high voltage laser containment system. Simply turning it off would be like dropping a bomb in the city. Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Brian Auten and I'm joined by Chad Gross. How are you doing this week, Chad? I'm doing well. I've uh, been kind of a crazy week. Uh, I have a student teacher in my classroom, though, so she teaches for half the day. So that is really nice. So I've had a, a busy week outside of school, but school's been a little more laid back. So I appreciate that. Uh-huh. How about you? How are you? Been a lot of snow this week. A lot of snow. Got, it went oh, below man. freezing this week, and uh, it was not pleasant. Now, do you like snow? I can I can never remember that. Are you a snow guy? I or don't not? mind it, except that I don't like working when it's snowing because I'm outside quite a bit in like a workshop. Right over here in Hagerstown, Maryland, is where I'm at. For anyone new to the podcast, uh, we have not gotten any snow, mm. and uh, so, I mean not anything we had a dusting but I, it was it it barely rose to the dignity of being called a dusting you know what i mean so i'm kind of waiting on the snow i i spent part of my childhood in erie pennsylvania where we would get like routinely a foot and a half two feet of snow we'd get these beautiful snows here we get nothing i'm hoping for something so i'm a little jealous <laughs> when it snows and the kids i mean the kids it was dark it was night and it was snowing, but it was nice packing snow. And the kids were just out like for hours in the darkness, having snowball fights and stuff. It was it was great. It's great. Got some peace. Well, uh, so uh, today, <laughs> today we've got a guest who is probably enjoying some snow in Colorado. I'm, I'm guessing he's on mountain time. It's Mark Middleberg. He's been with us before. He's an internationally recognized speaker and best-selling author on evangelism and the Christian faith. He's written several books, including... Confident Faith, Building a Firm Foundation for Your Beliefs, The Questions Christians Hope No One Will Ask, and the one we'll be talking about or centering our conversation around today called Contagious Faith, Discover Your Natural Style for Sharing Jesus with Others. Mark is the Executive Director of the Lee Strobel Center for Evangelism and Applied Apologetics at Colorado Christian University. You can find more about that at strobelcenter.com, and they offer accredited online bachelor's and master degrees, as well as certificate courses. Today, our conversation will center on Mark's book and training course, Contagious Faith. Looking forward to talking to Mark about evangelism. Yeah, I really appreciated the book, Contagious Faith. Over the years, since becoming a Christian, I've always been interested in talking to people about the gospel and their beliefs. And and uh, one of the things that I've I found is, it's in my experience anyway, is it seems depending on who you read, you read a different style of evangelism. Mm. And what the trap I have fallen to in the, into in the past is that I read and then I think, oh, okay, this is how you do it. Mm. This is mm -hmm. how you do evangelism, you know? So I try it that way, but it, it doesn't necessarily feel natural. It, it, it's almost like as a teacher, sometimes I have to teach a lesson plan somebody else wrote. And I don't like that yeah. because it feels like I'm it's not me, you know? And so one of the things I love about Contagious Faith is it presents five different styles of evangelism, even talks about how some of these interact with one another, but that once you find your own style and you're confident in that, then you're going to feel more confident in sharing your faith. And so I, I would really say that if someone wants to pick up a great book about evangelism, I would put this one and Greg Kokel's tactics, uh, kind of at the top of my list, mm -hmm. uh, because I feel like tactics get you going like right away, regardless of your your knowledge level. But what I like about Contagious Faith is this is going to give you the tools that you need to not only discover your own style, but also the tools you want to learn more and to even go further in sharing your faith and growing in your confidence. Mm hmm. I like how it is kind of made it okay to approach evangelism in a certain way, because as you mentioned, when you, when you've been around certain uh, influences, you think, oh, well, I have to do it that way. Even though it's not your style, you think, well, because they're really effective in this methodology or approach, 
that if you don't do it that way, that, oh, you're compromising or, uh, you know, I, oh, well, you're not supposed to friendship evangelize. That's a cop out. You know, I would always feel guilty sure. if, I, if, if I'm in my mind, I'm thinking, well, you know, I just need to be friendly with this person for a while. And all the all the time having this false sense of guilt, like, oh, Brian, you should be talking more about the gospel or something. And it's not mm-hmm. like the Holy Spirit saying that at that, that time. It's more like this expectation that I need to live up to someone else's example or their strength. So in a way, it's given taking the pressure off to try to do it like someone else, because it demonstrates that there are different natural styles. And the other mm-hmm. other thing that I thought was interesting was, I, to be honest, I kind of thought going in before I read it and kind of looking at the table of contents, I was thinking to myself, is this one of those books where it's like, oh, here are various personality styles. And now here's how you do it. If you're this personality style, that's kind of what I thought it was going to oh, be. Right. But no, it was like, no, here, here's scriptural examples of people sharing their faith and they fall into these different categories. And, and here, we'll go through some of them. Friendship building, serving or selfless serving, story sharing, reason giving and truth telling. So I think Mark does a good job of showing that these are uh, examples we find in scripture and that they tend to be a style that usually you will have one or two of these as your your go-to based on your personality or or maybe your temperament, you know. So mm-hmm. it's it makes evangelism a little less intimidating in that sense. You're not trying to be something you're not. Indeed. Yeah, Mark tells a story in the book about going door to door with someone and and he was just like this is not <laughs> yeah. this is not <laughs> what i want to be doing right now i i don't want to do this but the person he was with was like this is this was like easy for them and then yes. but his his method or his style would be more like reason giving and so people would point others to him to sort of mm-hmm. carry that part where he was able to minister to people in a different way that, that was not someone else's style or strength so yeah, and one of the things that encouraged me in the book is uh, just to, as a matter of continue to continue to pray for, is that uh, I have in the past gone to a local park downtown to talk to people about the gospel, hand out tracts, talk to Jehovah's Witnesses because they set up quite frequently. Uh, but you know, one of the things I've prayed about is finding somebody who wanted to do that with me mm-hmm. on a regular basis, who really had a passion for it and a knack for it. And he talks about in the book the advantage of of kind of doing evangelism in in tandem. And so that's one of the things I want to continue to pray for. Um, If you would just move here, that would make my life a lot easier, (laughs) honestly. Or but of course, then again, I could move there. So I I can't I can't put it all on you. I'm working on the wife, man. You know, I'm working on the wife. You know, I keep saying, look, Brian calls the place he lives a shire. You love Lord of the Rings. What more do you need? (laughs) But there's all these practical things she keeps bringing up. Yeah, silly. Well, let's go to the interview and talk to Mark. Let's get ready. Switch me on. All right. Well, Mark Middleberg, thanks for joining us for the podcast. Oh, great to be with you, Brian. It's been a long time. Yes, yes, indeed. Now you're in Colorado and I imagine like you've been snowboarding today or skiing or anything like that. A little shoveling now and then, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it, I, I live out in the woods of Colorado and we're in one of those seasons where it's like every day and a half, we get a few more inches. And yeah, so yeah, we've been busy just trying to keep our driveway clear. Now, do you like snow? I, yeah, yeah I don't like I don't like it quite as often as we've been getting it. But yeah, I do like living in a place where you can go out in the evening and there's a little chill in the air and um, you don't have to be running an air conditioner all the time. So I do like I do like that. I like the seasons. Now, one of the things that uh, you're doing in Colorado is you're at the Strobel Center. Can you talk a little bit about that and uh, what that is? Because I don't know if our listeners know about the university there in Colorado and what's available. Yeah. First of all, Lee Strobel and I have been best friends and ministry partners for 35 years or so, 36, something like that. Uh, we started in ministry the very same day 
and uh, kind of in various ways mentored each other. He was a younger Christian. I mentored him in theology and you know, spent two years going through a systematic theology together and studying. Mm -hmm. He mentored me in writing. And uh, over the years, we've done all kinds of books and courses and uh, speaking together. And well, that kind of has reached a point of kind of culmination in this thing we started called the Lee Strobel Center for Evangelism and Applied Apologetics at Colorado Christian University, Mm -hmm. which, yes, is a mouthful. But uh, we're thrilled because uh, Colorado Christian University, CCU for short, is a solidly biblical uh, university, you know, not flirting with wokeness or not compromising the scriptures. I mean, they're they're really one of the remaining solid institutions out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a vision. One of their, their stated purposes is to help every student become an evangelist. And uh, we we knew the former president. We got to know the current president, uh, Don Sweeting, and really felt synergy. And we, anyway, we, about right when COVID was starting, we launched this thing called the Strobel Center. And I'm the executive director. Uh, Lee and I helped uh, shape the courses through uh, largely through our books and writings and courses that you know seminar um, curricula that we've done over the years. Um, and the, you know, what we've got now, and by the way, that's what we did during the lockdowns is worked with mm-hmm. 40 PhDs, uh, including our friend, Kurt Jaros, uh, mm-hmm. and others to develop courses. And now we have fully online, fully accredited undergraduate and master's degree in applied apologetics and evangelism and uh, got a bunch of students going through it. Uh, It's going great. We also have, for those that say, I want the training, but I don't need the college credit, or I want something more, you know, a little more in my budget. We also have lower cost certificate courses where people can study the same things without all the rigor of a academic degree. But we're thrilled, and our mission is to train apologetically oriented evangelists whose goal is to not just win an argument, but to win people to Christ, but who aren't afraid of arguments and and really are confident in the evidence and and information we have that back up the Christian faith. And uh, we're seeing it. Uh, One of our first grads in the uh, master's program, Lee and I had lunch with him to congratulate him just a few months back, uh, a guy named Jimmy Wallace. Uh, Jay Warner Wallace's yeah. son, and uh, Jimmy got his master's uh, through our program and was super positive about it. And he's doing great stuff on his uh, YouTube channel and mm-hmm. you know various social media platforms. And so I mean, he's an example of the kind of people we want to help train and ignite. I mean, he was already ignited, but we want to help unleash people. Uh, to do effective, thoughtful outreach in a culture that's headed the wrong direction. Yeah, cool. Well, we'll link to that in the show notes, strobelcenter.com. You know, a huge impact that has been made with both Lee's and your work and books over the years with the Case for Christ, Case for Faith, sort of genre of apologetics books. But then there's been a number of books you've written as well or or worked with uh, Lee and others uh, about evangelism and and making that more accessible and approachable for people who, you know, I think evangelism is something we all would like to hear other people stories about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And, and then and then when it comes to uh, you know what about me? Am I evangelizing? Then it's like, ooh, ow, that's a tender spot. Don't push there. Um, yeah, exactly. And so uh, you've got your work cut out for you. But then again, when I, when I read Chad and I have read your, your book, Contagious Faith, we both were really um, impressed on how it made approaching evangelism and sharing your faith way more natural and approachable. It, it didn't seem like something that I had to emulate someone else. It was like, oh, well, yeah. well, what, what's my approach? And, and then what does that look like? And where is it in the scripture? So maybe you could just talk a bit about what you think, what are some of the biggest obstacles that you think the church faces when, when it comes to approaching evangelism or sharing their faith? Sure. 
Yeah, uh, I think there are two. Uh, one you've kind of alluded to already. I mean, most of us, as if you're a true believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you, you know the scriptures, you know evangelism is important. You love to hear stories of, you know, people coming to faith. You know, we love evangelism when someone else does it. Um, right. But, but we get intimidated about it ourselves. And I think the number one barrier is I don't have that personality. I, that's not me. I don't have the special gifting. I don't have the special equipment. I don't have the right training. Um, and I think Satan turbocharges that sense. I mean, he whispers in your ear, like, you know, maybe when you read all those Christian books you have stacked up on your nightstand or in your bookshelf, you know, maybe after you get your master's degree in, apolo- you know, philosophy, religion, or apologetics, uh, maybe when you completely stop sinning, then you could go do events. Yeah. And we all feel inadequate. All of us feel inadequate for the task. And it's because we are. Um, but you know, Jesus said, go anyway, go into all the world and I'll be with you. My spirit will work through you. Um, You know, and of course we have truth on our side and so on. So that's a lot of what I deal with. That's the number one thing I deal with in the original materials I did years ago called Becoming a Contagious Christian. uh, And now the completely reworked, updated stuff uh, called Contagious Faith. And it's to help Ordinary Christians like me and you realize there's a way we can do this that could fit us, could fit our personality. But to finish answering the question, I think the second biggest barrier is we haven't done the work of preparation. And uh, so I'm not saying you have to get a master's degree to be prepared. I'm saying, you know, there is something to being ready. And First Peter 3.15 says, you know, be prepared to give an answer. And a lot of us kind of deep down know I haven't done the preparation. And so, again, that, that doesn't have to be super in-depth. I, I do like a quote from a fellow evangelist who says, if you know enough to know Christ, if you know enough to be saved, you know enough to share salvation with other people, to share hmm. Christ. Um, so I agree with that, but I also think our confidence grows when we— you know, kind of think through what would I say? Or, you know, if someone says, what's your story? Well, what, what, how can I kind of summarize that? Um, or, you know, what, you know, the Bible's a big book. What, give me the bottom line. What, what is this? What's the real message? Well, a lot of us get intimidated because we haven't thought through how to summarize and we really, it's not hard to summarize, uh, but we need to think that through and get ready. And again, that's the goal of both the Contagious Faith book and uh, there's a six-week video training course Mm -hmm. for small groups to do that together. Hmm. Well, before we get into talking about what what's unique about your book, because there there are some unique features about it, is I, I you mentioned there how there are people who are Christians but they are resistant to evangelism. Uh, I know that uh, I got saved when I was 25. I'm 46 now. And uh, evangelism has just always been something I've been interested in doing. But it seems to me that I get a lot of pushback from Christians who want to say things such as, uh, well, I have my testimony. That's all I need. Or another thing is, as well, you know, some people um, enjoy those intellectual arguments and and engagements and things, but I'm more uh, of the nature of experience. And, and so they'll kind of use these ideas to push back against the idea that they should be more actively sharing their faith. And, and some even feel like it, it's it's almost bad to challenge somebody else's ideas. You know, they've kind of soaked in that cultural idea that we shouldn't challenge other people's <laughs> beliefs, yeah. if you will. So so what what would be some 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 challenges, some encouragements that you would have for people who who kind of throw out those kind of ideas? Good question, Chad, and uh, lots of things could be said. I, one that strikes me uh, with the last part of what you said, where you, you know you really shouldn't challenge people's ideas. Well, the person who's saying that is challenging our idea, <laughs> right? Uh, oh, that's a great point. Well, and not not really even our idea. Jesus' command to go into mm. the world and make disciples. That means help them, you know, come under the discipline and, and obedience to Christ. And he's going, you know, I think that's the main reason he left us on this planet is to tell people. And it's good news that there's a Savior. You know, we are sinners. We need a Savior. There's good news. But with that is the challenge that you you need to submit to the God of the universe, the God who made you, the God who died to redeem you. 
you need to say yes to him and don't call yourself a Christian and then say to Jesus, I'm not going to do that. I'm not, uh, I don't agree with that. I think it's wrong to tell someone else they're wrong. Well, now you're telling Jesus he's wrong and you're telling everyone in the church who's trying to follow his mission that they're wrong. So ultimately you're going to tell someone they're wrong. Why don't we tell the people that Jesus told us to go to and tell them they need something different. So that's, that, that's one thought. Um, yeah, it's helpful. Yeah. Um, it really gets to the core of what my book is about. And that is there are different approaches. There are different, uh, right in the pages of the new Testament, they took different approaches and that's, you know, I, I call them faith sharing styles and some people are more testimony oriented. And so great. You have, I call it the story sharing styles to share your story. Uh, mm. Some people are, uh, well, and, and that's actually pretty related to the experiential. It's like, here's my experience with Christ. Now mm. I, I do put cautions in the book. You know, when you share your story, don't just keep it subjective and, and don't keep it you know, all mysterious. I was on the, I was walking on the beach and it was late one night and then it <laughs> happened. And, and now I know Jesus and, and people are going, well, where's this beach? Do it. What time of the night do I need to go? And, you know, it has to be biblical and transferable. It's, so yeah, I was on a beach, I was walking along and I sensed God was speaking to me. I sensed that what scripture says is true, that, that I've been running away from God and that it was time for me to turn back to him. I sensed it was true that I'm a sinner and I've mm -hmm. offended a holy God, but I also sensed that it was time for me to trust in Jesus and his, his death and payment on my behalf. See, now what you're doing is using your story to load in the, the message of the gospel. And I would just remind those folks that, you know, Romans 1.16 says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Uh, your testimony can en en encompass the gospel. It should. But it's not just, I used to be this, now I'm this, you know, God bless you, be at peace. It, no, what I found was the gospel. I found the Savior. And what I found you you need to find you you need to look into so that's part of what i would say to that person that's more of the story sharing but maybe it would help maybe to back up and and talk about just what these styles are because i i see at least five and there may be more but at least five approaches to sharing our faith in the pages of the new testament that i think can be liberating to all of us as believers yeah that'd be great and it might help to put a backdrop because I know as our listeners listen, they're going, okay, this guy's been writing on evangelism forever. He's, he's probably one of those guys that just grew up loving it. It's natural for him. Actually quite the opposite. Then I pretty early in the book, tell the story how uncomfortable I was. And I mean, I'm just a kid that grew up in a rural state, I, you know, up in the frozen tundra uh, <laughs> in the state of North Dakota. Um, I, I, you know, I came to Christ at age 19. I didn't have any special training or uh, any of that. But yet I knew I was supposed to share my faith. I knew we are here to spiritually impact others. And I stumbled around and, and God would use me in spite of my ineptitude. I finally, later when I went to grad school, I ended up doing a summer. I signed, kind of naively signed up for a summer tour of duty uh, serving a church in London, England, and uh, showed up all, you know, kind of green, like, hey, what are we going to do? And they're going, oh, we're so glad you're here. We're going to knock on doors and tell people about Jesus all summer. And it's like, oh, boy, what did I sign up for here? And so I've been through the school of hard knocks. I know what it is to be really uncomfortable. And honestly, even though I love the people, I love the church, I, you know, I had some good, I had some good experiences there. It did not fit me. And I'm, well, by the time I was on the airplane flying back to the U.S., it was like, evangel I, I'm done with evangelism. This is not my thing. Um, and I was at the time getting my master's degree in philosophy of religion at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. I knew I loved apologetics, but I, I thought, this, this evangelism thing is not me. Well, I needed to learn some new things, and that's what I share in the book. And, and what I began to realize is 
apologetics done right is evangelism. In fact, mm-hmm. I like what Jay Warner Wallace says, you know, evangelism in the 21st century is spelled apologetics. Mm-hmm. But that's also Jay Warner Wallace talking. That's me talking. That's Lee Strobel talking. It's probably Brian and you guys talking. You know, we, we love apologetics, but that's just one of the five styles. And here, here's what I learned and here is how I distill it. Some people are more friendship oriented. They're more relationship oriented. Uh, they're like Matthew, the tax collector who comes to Jesus. It says in Luke 5, 29, that he had a big banquet at his house and invited the tax collector friends and the new disciple friends and Jesus had a big party. Well, he was the friendship building style. And I think some of our listeners today, that's them. They're just relational. They like hanging out at, you know, a coffee shop or a pizza place or having people into their home. And they build natural relational bridges with people and uh, I say, wow, use that. That's that's probably the most broad style. And, and Jesus used it. He was a friend of sinners. You know, he would reach out relationally to people that the religious establishment wouldn't touch, literally. And yet he did and broke down the barriers and God used that. And we call that the friendship building style. Uh, the second one I talk about in the book is the um, selfless serving style. And the example is Tabitha in Acts 9, uh, who made clothing for needy people in her community, kind of used her service. She served with her hands mm-hmm. in the you know, ways that made people's heads turn heavenward, kind of like a first century Mother Teresa. And uh, I, I see that as an important approach. But it's not just serving or serving silently. You know, I think the church has grown a lot in the last couple of decades in the area of missional Christianity that we don't just you know, love with our words. We love with actions. We help people in tangible ways. I couldn't agree more, except I think there's been a pretty sharp pendulum swing. Instead of telling people about Jesus, instead of confronting ideas or debating truth or any of that. We're just going to serve people lovingly and maybe they'll come to Christ. That's the danger in this style. Right. Uh, We need to serve in ways that raise spiritual curiosity, but then we need to be ready to tell them what it is that motivates us to serve, who it is that motivates us to serve and who he is and what he's done for them. Somehow we need to get to the gospel, um, and serving can be a great way to open those doors. Our third one is uh, the one, Chad, that you actually alluded to, the more testimonial. Mm-hmm. And the example we use on this one in Scripture is the blind man in John 9, who Jesus heals, uh, gives him his sight. He's, of course, blown away. You know, Wow, I can see. Uh, barely has a chance to blink before he finds himself on trial in front of the religious leaders who are pressing him with questions about how this happened and who did it and who is Jesus and by what authority, by what power. And the guy's like rolling his eyes, you know, seeing how that feels. And (laughs) and he's going, look, I don't know. All I know is this. I used to be blind. Now I can see. And Jesus did it. Maybe you ought to look into Jesus. Well, that's that was his story as he knew it to that point. He later then, you know, gets to know Jesus and I think more understands the gospel and would have more to say as part of his to- story or testimony. But he used his story in a powerful way, and uh, we call that the story sharing style. And some of us, you know, that's I think our main weapon uh, in the battle of evangelism is to speak out of our experience in ways that make the gospel clear. And my best example of this is my buddy and ministry partner, Lee Strobel, who, you know, if you ever read any of his Case for Christ books, Case for Faith, any of those, they're woven around his experience as as a former atheist who investigated the faith after, you know, his wife had become a Christian. He looks into it. He ends up saying, it would take more faith to maintain my atheism than to become a Christian, and he becomes a Christian after like two years of research. Well, anytime Lee speaks, you know, he speaks out of experience. When I used to be a skeptic, when I used to be a newspaper reporter, here's what I thought. Here, you know, 
And uh, so he uses that really well, but he use it, uses it in ways that get to the point of the gospel. And so we call that the story sharing style. And uh, I think it's a powerful one because we are an experiential culture where people don't want to just know truth, don't want to just hear arguments. They want to know, Chad, does it work for you? Brian, what difference does Jesus make in your life? And we need to be prepared to give that answer. You mentioned um, sort of some of the pitfalls, uh, you know, where yeah. you can, if, for instance, uh, if you're building a friendship, you could just, uh, to my mind, I see it as like, uh, oh, well, I'm just going to befriend this person. I, I'm comfortable with that. Yes. But then, but then there's always that point of friction where, okay, now I've got to get out of my comfort and share the gospel somehow. So the pitfall there is just to be an eternal friend with someone and never yeah. talk to them. Whereas like selfless serving, you mentioned how you can just serve, serve and just be quiet and yeah. not say anything. Story sharing, maybe there's not that same pitfall because you, the core of that is that you are sharing your experience. Is there any way that people can kind of muck that up, if you will? <laughs> yeah, I, I actually share in the book and in the training course dangers or cautions on all of the styles because they all have their kind of flip side of things that are easy to, to, to mess up, as you say. Yeah, so with the story sharing style, I think the danger, one of the dangers is to become real subjective about it, kind of play into the culture where you say, well, this is what happened to me. And, and then you get that typical response of, well, you know, that, I'm so happy for you. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm glad, you know, Jesus is what works for you. And, right. you know, for me, it's more meditation or crystals or Buddha or, or I'm just, you know, I just try to be a good person or whatever. That's where we have to have the guts to say, you know, you need to know Jesus came, you know, and he, he came for all of us. And yes, that's my story of how he changed my life. But Christ, all of us need Christ. We are all sinners who need a Savior. That's where you get more to the gospel again, mm -hmm. more to the story that God made us, we're fallen, we're sinful, we need a Savior, we can't pay for it ourselves. Meditation isn't going to take away the, the mark in our soul, nor will other religions. You know, you can get into Buddhism. The Buddha himself said, I am not a Savior and there is no Savior. Um, you can hmm. get into all these other things. There's only one solution where God became one of us and paid the penalty for our sins. So we have to have the courage to go from our story to them, to their story, to their need. And not in a pushy way, not, you know, and, you know, you meditate and it, it helps your blood pressure go down. Well, that's great. But, you know, Jesus talked about meditating or the Bible talks about meditating on the word of God and, and truth. I think meditation will go a lot further if you're focused on the right things and if you're uh, turning mm -hmm. to the right source of strength and, and power and to the truth of a God who loves it. You know, it's somehow, I don't know if those are the best words, but somehow to steer it back to the objective truth of the gospel. And yeah, Brian, going back to the other ones, the relational one, boy, the temptation there, like you say, is kind of hang out, you know, and people say, well, I do relational evangelism. And, and the truth is they do relational <laughs> and, and leave the <laughs> no evangelism, evangelism part out. Yeah. But, but I would go back to that one and say, I call this the friendship building style of evangelism. What kind of friend are you if you spend years hanging out with someone who's lost, someone who doesn't know Christ, someone who's who's lost in their sins and destined for a Christ, destined for a Christless eternity? What kind of a friend are we not to tell them? You know what? There's good news. There's there's a solution. There's a savior, and I love you enough to tell you the truth, even if. You're a little resistant, and and I think there's ways to ease into that. I, I remember a, a friend of mine named Nancy. Her dad was on his deathbed, and he was always resistant to spiritual conversation. Um, and she said to him, she said, Dad, he, he, I mean, he was really near death. She said, Dad, I know we have like this unwritten rule in our family that we never talk about God or spiritual stuff. Mm. But with your permission, I would like to talk about it now. 
I said, she said, would it be okay just for a few minutes if I, he said, yeah, I guess, ah, you know, what could it hurt? Yeah, okay. And he kind of opened the door just enough. So it was a winsome way of kind of getting clearance. And then she proceeded and the conversation deepened. She ended up leading her dad to Christ on his deathbed. Amen. But but it takes the courage to go that next, you know, that as one guy said, you know, the next, you know, the last 10%, you know, where you say, I know, you know, this is real in my life. I know, you know, this is important. I need, we need to talk about you. Yeah. And, and you, you'll go into it with fear and trepidation, but Jesus said, lo, I will be with you always. So, you know, we just got to remember, this is God's idea. It's God's great commission. It's the mission he gave us. This is not us trying to, you know, change people. It's us trying to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to see him work in other people's lives. Mark, um, I feel like, you know, there's plenty of people who have friendships where they've not breached the subject of spiritual things. And in the book, one of the cool things you do say is that, you know, when you're making a friendship, you know, drop hints along the way so that it doesn't become a big awkward thing. Like, uh, we've never talked about this for so so long. Uh, so you, yeah. you should you should let it let them know up front that you're a Christian in some way. And I thought that was helpful. But um, what help do you have for those who do have friendships that, hey, I, I've known this person for eight years and they know I'm a Christian, but we've never even talked about that subject. How, how is there a way to open that up without just feeling like, uh oh, I'm going to puke right now because <laughs> this is such an awkward uh, say How do I, you know, they, I, I would see that as a quite an obstacle. Like it's like a big deal now when it yeah. shouldn't have got to the point where now it's a big deal. Any well, suggestions along that yeah, line? First, let me just underscore the first part of it. That's why we don't want to wait eight years. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because very, right. the longer you wait, the harder it gets. Uh, because then you're going to say, well, let me tell you about the most important part of my life. And they're going like, since when? And so it's so much easier and better. You know, if we just drop hints, you know, mention, oh, uh, sorry, I can't do that that day. I'm at a men's retreat with our church or I'm um, going to be at church that morning or I'm uh, whatever I'm uh, or, or mentioning a book you've read or, you know, a great podcast you just listened to that was super encouraging just to drop that stuff out there and, and uh, put it, you know, and they may not pick up on it. They may not want to talk about it, but then it kind of clears the air it clear. At some point you can have a conversation because you've been more open about it. But back to your question, Brian, what do you do if you haven't done that? I think prayerfully uh, look for an opportunity and it might even be say, hey, let's have coffee, let's have breakfast together, uh, and then sit down with them and, you know, say, you know, I wanted to get together today partly to apologize for something. And they're like, what? What? what, do you, what? Yeah, you know, and you go, well, there, there's a part of my life that is so important and I think could be so helpful to you that I should have talked about this years ago. And yet I'm kind of, you know, learning how to talk about it. And it's kind of, uh, you know, I don't want to offend you. And, you know, I, I, I'm a little nervous. I'm a little nervous right now. Just be honest with them and right. say, but I just want you to know that Christ has changed my life. And, you know, I, I'm not coming to you saying, you know, you got to get religious. You got to, you know, start going to church five times a week. or That's not what I'm saying. but what I have found in Christ is so important and so helpful in my life. I apologize for not sharing it with you sooner. And if it's mm -hmm. okay, I'd like That's to good. talk about it now. I think just something like that, it may, mm -hmm. may not need to be quite that intense, but just to say, you know, there's something I've often thought about saying, and I, I should have said it earlier, but could I talk about kind of the spiritual side of my life for a few minutes? Most yeah. people are like, sure. And I, I, it was Becky Pippert in her book, Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World. She tells a story about just this kind of situation where she finally just said to the friend, I, you know, I've wanted to tell you about this a number of times, but I've been afraid because I didn't want to offend you. Mm -hmm. And the friend said, it's so refreshing to finally meet a Christian who understands that you, you know, you guys offend us. 
if you're sensitive enough to get that, I'm open enough to listen to what you have to say. Mm-hmm. So That's I think good. just being authentic and real. Uh, the other tip I would throw in on that is do it one on one. Don't don't bring it up in a, a group at a party with six people, you know, around the table. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's a place for that too, but but generally people are going to be more receptive, more open if we talk to them one on one. That's yeah. really good stuff. Very helpful. So one of the ones that you you haven't talked about yet is the um the reason giving uh which yeah. is you know more yeah. your your natural style I know you say in the book that's also kind of mine's a combination of the story and and the reason which listeners should know that that's one of the things Mark's talks talks about in the book is that it can a lot of these cross over with one another sure. um but one of the things that I see is is I'm offering reasons and arguments and evidence for, for people one of the things that I have run into and I've approached it various ways, but I'm interested to hear how, what your recommendations would be is that there always comes another objection, right? Yeah. So in other words, I feel like I'm giving quality answers. They're not really <clears throat> responding in the sense of saying, oh, well, that still doesn't make sense. It's more of, oh, okay. All right. He answered that one. All right. Well, what about this? Yeah. And then you answer that. What about this? And this could go out out, at go on ad nauseum. So I'm wondering kind of what your thoughts would be is is how to best approach that. Yes. Um, And I've run into that many times. And and what I finally do and I'll answer, I'll I'll be patient with the process as an apologist, as you know, know, be gentle, be respectful. Yes. Um, And it is a process. That's a great. Yeah, it is a process. Yeah. I actually remember it was a meeting once uh, when I was in England where I'd been doing some teaching more on apologetics. The guy would ask a question and it was, it was funny because we were in a room standing up and I would kind of step closer to him, answer the question. He'd go, Oh, I've never thought of that before. And then he stepped back and asked another question. I'd step forward and answer it. And he'd step back. And this continued as we kind of went around the room circling. And I finally reached a point, and I think we need to reach this point, where I said, can I just pause our conversation and make an observation? He said, yeah, wh- what? And I said, I just want to be really honest with you. I don't mean to offend you. It seems like you're working a lot harder to come up with the next objection than you are at getting answers that would help you. Mm. In other words, it seems like you're you're trying to find intellectual excuses. You know, I've given you some good answers here, and they're true. And the more you look into it, the more confident you can become. But it seems like you're just going, well, I don't want, I don't, okay, you, you, you dealt with that. I don't really want it to be true. So what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? And I said, when I see someone doing that, I said, I sense that there's an underlying issue going on. And it's probably more of a personal issue. Uh, perhaps something you don't want to give up or change because, you know, if you gave your life to Christ, he doesn't want that in your life. Mm. Or maybe you just don't like the idea of a God leading your life uh, or controlling. What is it that you're afraid of that makes you keep coming up with all these objections? And uh, I, I don't remember the exact, this is many years ago. I, I know it was something of a moral nature. But and I've heard Josh McDowell tell similar stories where you know, a guy kept talking about the manuscript evidence and you're throwing objections out. And he, he finally said, what, what, what are you hiding? <laughs> and the guy goes, well, I'm living with my girlfriend. I, I don't think Jesus likes that. He goes, that's your issue. Hmm. So, and it doesn't mean they don't have any intellectual issues, but it's almost sure. never just intellectual. It's usually... Uh, it, it can be a, an area of sin they're trying to protect, you know, and you, we have all these quotes of famous atheists, uh, Huxley and others, you know, they don't want it to be true. Um, Nagel, or it can yeah. be that they were hurt. Uh, that would be more like Templeton, uh, the atheist in Canada that Lee Strobel interviewed in The Case for Faith. He was offended that God didn't send rain in time to help an African woman save her baby. So it was for him, it was more of the problem of pain and suffering. So I think that when we can get to what that personal issue is, there's other famous skeptics that, you know, they, their wife left them and that ticked them off at God or, you know, those kinds of stories. And so I think we try to say, let's get beyond these surface level 
you know, objections. I don't sense this is the real issue. Can we be honest with each other? What is it? And often people will open up and then you say, all right, now let's really talk about that. Hmm. Because, you know, if you're going to stay angry, if you're going to keep shaking your fist at God um, over something that happened 20 years ago, you're never going to, you know, I can give you answers all night long and it's not going to solve this because your real issue is your anger at God. So let's talk, you know, and then you go into that. Um, but if I could shift or, uh, you know, just to broaden it, because that is the fourth of the five styles, just so I don't leave people wondering what these other ones are. Right. Uh, we, we call it the reason giving style. And our example in scripture is Paul all over the place, but especially in Acts 17, where he's in Athens, Greece. And if you watch what he does there, talking to a bunch of philosophers, he gives a very logical, well-reasoned presentation of the gospel. You know, there's a God who loves us. He, he, he uh, is the God of the world. He's the real God. Um, but he came as one of us. He came to, you know, to redeem us. He, he kind of spells it all out in a very logical way. And that's who Paul was. He was uh, someone who he often said, we persuade people. We take thoughts captive. We bring thoughts in subject to, subjection to Christ. That's Second Corinthians ten, and so this this was Paul's style. He was a reason giver, and this is what liberated me after that summer in England, coming away going that that direct style, you know, kind of confrontational evangelism is not me. I I love it when other people do it. I celebrate those who have that style. It's not mine. That's, by the way, the fifth one, which I'll get to in a minute. But I began to realize that my apologetics was my evangelism style, that giving reasons. I don't just want to get, argue with people. I don't, I, you know, I don't think the ultimate goal is to win an argument. I think it's to win people to Christ. But sometimes you need to have a few good arguments to, to get to that point, to to open them up, to kind of bring down the intellectual barriers. So um, I encourage, I know a lot of our listeners, That's this is more your style, but here's my challenge. Don't just argue with people. Mm -hmm. Don't feel like you've succeeded just because you made a point and they couldn't debate you on it. No, that's just to clear the path to get back to the gospel. And it's the message of the cross that is the power of God unto salvation, according to Romans one sixteen. So mm -hmm. use apologetics. Apologetics is the handmaiden to evangelism. You use it to clear the path and then get back to the point of the gospel. All right, good stuff. Now, I'll, I'll ask you about the fifth style, Mark. Uh, yes. Truth telling being, and I see this as like more of a direct, bold, to the point style. Can you explain that one? The truth telling style, I mean, we're all supposed to tell the truth and we, you know, we all have a mission, but this style is exactly what you said, Brian. This is the more hard hitting, more direct, more, come on, let's get to the point. Come on. You've been sitting on the fence way too long, buddy. Uh, time to get off that. Doesn't your rear end hurt? Get off that fence. Come on. Um, you know, they love verses like where Paul says, but behold, today is the day of salvation. You know, this is, this is, you know, don't miss your season of opportunity. So it's just more of a preaching, uh, declaring, uh, proclaiming. Yeah. Yes. And it, it might be preaching from a stage. It might be on a podcast. Mm -hmm. It might be one-on-one -on -one conversation, but yeah, this mm -hmm. is the kind of person like, don't give me that stuff. Come on. Well, let me just give you the story from my own life. Cause I need, I'm not that style. England proved that to me that time in London, <laughs> but I needed someone with that style to wake me up spiritually. And uh, I grew up, I mean, here, here's the quick story. I grew up in a Christian home. In fact, get this, my parents met at Wheaton College uh, in, you know, Wheaton College where Billy Graham went. Uh, you know, th that's sort of like predestination when your parents, you know, met at Wheaton College and you're born into a family that's all about <laughs> that. But I was a black sheep. I was a rebel. Uh, I, you know, I believed intellectually, but I wasn't walking with Christ. I was 19 years old and a friend from high school walked into the store where I was working and confronted me. And he said, you claim to be a Christian. I said, yeah, what about it? And he goes, well, but I know too much about your life. You do this, you do this, you have a reputation for that. I said, well, and I didn't know what to say. I mean, this guy's confronting me. He's very direct. He's a truth teller. 
And I looked at him, his name's Terry. I said, well, Terry, I guess I'm a cool Christian. Uh, you know, we have more fun. We we don't get all legalistic about everything and hung up on all the rules. And he goes, yeah, there's a word for cool Christians. I said, well, what's that? Hypocrite. I mean, he's oh, looking shit. me in the eyes, calling me a hypocrite. And I got mad. And I'm like, oh, Terry, who, who the heck do you think you are? You have your life all together. You, you're claiming you're perfect. He goes, no, but I'm honest about it. I'm like. <laughs> Okay, we're done. He leaves. <laughs> we're I'm done. walking around fuming, like who, this guy's so cocky. He's so. And then the Holy Spirit started talking, and God used Terry's truth telling to push me off the spiritual fence that I'd been on for a long time because I knew what was right, I knew what was true, but I was, you know, messing with it. I wasn't living it. I wasn't committed to Christ. And it was within a week of that confrontation that direct truth telling that I gave my life to Christ. Mm. And so I I love the style and I'm thankful for the style. It's just not my style. But a lot of people they're they're more hard-hitting personalities, they're often type A, they're they're often leaders. Uh they're people who just can't not ma- make changes. They they have to speak up. They they just can't settle for status quo. Uh some of our listeners have this and uh I just want to say there's other Mark Middlebergs out there that need someone to get in their face with the truth. Oh, by the way, the biblical example we use on this is Peter. Very direct, Sh- right? Shocking. Very, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, the example we use is Acts chapter 2, Day of Pentecost. We, we forget what a gutsy thing this was. Weeks after the you know the, their leader and Messiah had been crucified for speaking truth, uh, and then raised from the dead, of course. But only weeks after that, in the very same city, he stands up in front of a Jewish audience of thousands of people and proclaims the gospel and, and lets them have it. Men of Israel, you know, God sent his Messiah, but you killed him. You're in big trouble with God. I mean, he lets them have it. And they go, mm-hmm. we know. What do we need to do to be saved? And he tells them, well, the good news is the Messiah you murdered came back to life three days later, and he loves you. And he wants you to come to him for salvation. He lays it all out there in a very direct way. And 3,000 people come to Christ just, you know, in that one encounter. And so, you know, I think, I think you know, some of the famous evangelists, I think, you know, Billy Graham was a truth teller, Luis Palau. I think uh, Greg Laurie uh, with his Harvest Crusades gets to the point challenges people get off the fence but there's a lot of people who do this you know not from a stage but you know across a coffee table too and uh so i encourage that one but and i think this person often opens the door i tell a story in contagious faith about my friend carl who i went in an ice cream shop with and he very directly talked to the guy behind the counter who was from the middle east and it turned into conversations. It turned into a team effort where people with all the styles got involved over the next year. And a year later, that Muslim friend named Fize gave his life to Christ and mm. changed his eternity. So, you know, I, I think it's important to try these. As we said earlier, you might be a combination of two or three of them. Uh, the idea here is not, you know, figure out your style and stay in your lane. The idea is, Try a bunch of stuff. Find an approach that fits you. Experiment. You may be style number six or seven that we didn't think of. Great. Uh, but the, the bottom line message is we're all called to be in the mission. Uh, we're all called to share the good news of Christ. Uh, we can do it in ways that fit us, and we can work as a team. So you can partner with other people when, you know, maybe you're not the uh, reason-giving style. You're more relational. Great. Build the relationship. And then bring someone like a Brian into the party and let him answer their questions. And then they want to know, let's say it's a Muslim, they want to know, am I the only person who's ever thought about this? No, let me introduce you to someone with, uh, you know, someone like a, a Nabil Qureshi when he was alive and let him tell you his story. Here's his book. He had the story sharing style in part. Mm. Um, so you see how we can work as a team together. Mm playing to our strengths, 
in ways that can be used by the Holy Spirit to help lead people to the gospel and to faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, I see this, uh, as you mentioned, like uh, everyone has sort of has their own zone where they might be more natural. And um, when I look at it, I also see this idea of, well, you know, with this person, I think this approach is going to work better. So I need to use that approach. So, so maybe it's not my forte, one, one thing yeah. or another, but I might be able to d discern from my interaction with someone that, hey, you know what, I, I need to just go and tell them the truth, even though I would yeah. want to just explain things to them or, you know, be their friend yeah. or something that they need to, maybe there's certain styles that people need in the same way that there's certain things that we're more naturally given to, you know, our own style, that this is what someone needs at that time, you know? Yeah. Excellent question, uh, Brian. And uh, we certainly, that's true. When we we're out there trying to share Christ, we get in situations where we're going, I think what this guy needs or this gal needs is something I'm not that good at. So what do you do? And I actually, in the Contagious Faith book, I have a whole chapter on what do you do when the situation doesn't right. fit your style. And my main answer is what I was just uh, mentioning a minute ago. Mm -hmm. And that is often we can partner with other pe we, people. We can mm -hmm. you say, you've just got to meet my friend, you know, Brian, who can answer these things. Uh, you know, I, I'll study with you. I'll do my best, but I got a buddy who loves these questions. Could, how about the three of us have a meal or have coffee next week? Mm -hmm. So you don't push it off. Uh, you know, you, you, you keep the process going, but you involve other people. That's, that's answer one. Answer two is there will be situations where God just says, I want you to stretch here. Uh, I know mm -hmm. this isn't your, your right. most comfortable kind of thing. I tell the story in the book uh, in contagious faith about my uncle Morris, who uh, was near the end of his life. I was in a situation where I, I, and I was a young believer when this happened, but I just sensed this guy needs to be confronted with truth. And I'm not the storytelling, excuse me, the truth telling direct style, but I'm, you know, God's calling me to do this anyway. And I stretched and, and he helped me and the Holy Spirit used it. Uh, I don't know if Morris ever came to Christ, but I know I delivered the message I was called to deliver mm -hmm. that day. So, yeah, sometimes you have to stretch. But from my experience, uh, for all of us who are freaked out by evangelism, generally we can play to our strengths and find situations where we can be used in those um, <clears throat> And then pull in other people. The gal who cuts my hair, I just got a haircut yesterday and I've been working on her for about three years. And there's parts of what she asks and needs that I can answer. And there's parts of it that I'm going, I'm not the right person. So I'm trying to introduce her to Kathy, uh, who lives mm -hmm. in my neighborhood, who was the first person that I talk about who came to Christ in the book or one of the early ones, uh, Kathy my neighborhood. Uh, but Kathy, and and I, I think she'll really help my hair gal. So I, I always am trying to pull in other people as well. Mm -hmm. mm. It's good stuff. Really, one of the things I really appreciated so much about the book was how regardless of what style that you shared or were talking about, you have a great emphasis on you need to get to the gospel. Right. Uh, yeah. And and of course, we've highlighted that numerous times throughout the interview. But one of the things and I was telling Brian pre-interview that I so appreciated about the book might be my favorite part. But then whenever you say your favorite part later on, you go, eh, maybe that was my favorite part. At least that's what I do. But yeah. um, might be my favorite part is when you talk about the gospel that we actually communicate and how today we have a much narrower gospel a lot of times that we share than the gospel that Jesus and his apostles would have been communicating. Can yeah. you kind of expound on that and explain that a bit? Because I, I think listeners will find it equally fascinating. Yeah. Um, and it's so funny when I was writing the book, I thought chapter, I think it's chapter eight. I thought that'll be the yes. easy one. That's on the gospel. You know, I, I've been teaching this for decades. So I'll uh, whip through that one. That ended up being the hardest chapter because I slowed down and uh, my publisher, one of the guys there, uh, John Raymond at Zondervan, he said, you, you need to read some broader stuff here on this. And, and, and I don't mean broader like liberal, but just broader perspective. And he, he had me read the King Jesus Gospel by Scott McKnight 
and that led to me reading some some of N.T. Wright stuff and some of some others, you know, a bunch of books. I, I it just like turned into this deep hole of study and and the the gist of it is we often kind of have a reductionistic salvation message that sometimes really gets reduced to you know if you just pray this prayer you can go to heaven and pray this prayer and and God will change your life and and you go back and you look at the gospel preaching in the book of acts and in the early church and even from Jesus himself it included the salvation message. Yes, there's a savior. Yes, you're a sinner who can be forgiven. Uh, the, the atonement of Christ, he paid for your sins. You know, that is, you know, the, the center point. But it was told in a broader context of the story of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And we live in a culture that is so spiritually uh, uneducated and unaware that when we start saying pray a prayer and then you can go to heaven, it's, it sounds like a magic incantation uh, or, or ask Jesus into your heart and then you know, he'll be with you. It, it almost sounds like, you know, a, a kind of a Santa Claus belief or a, you know, a little kid who needs their little, uh, you know, stuffed animal that gives them security when they go to sleep versus saying, no, you need to understand who Jesus was, who he is, and put it in the broader context of we are, you know, a fallen creature, you know, a fallen race. We are sinners who needed a savior. The Bible promised the coming of a Messiah slash savior who would be Emmanuel. He would be God with us. He would come and not just teach us, not just show us the way, but he would come in as Jesus said, give his life as a ransom for us. Um, and Isaiah 53, of course, you know, 700 years earlier showed that he would come and be our substitute. He would pay our, for our sins. So you, the broader story of how Jesus came, what his mission was, he came to seek and to save that which was lost and he laid on his life as a ransom. He did it. He died for our sins so that we don't have to. Uh, he rose to give us life. And it's in that broader story that the gospel has power. And once they understand that, to say, but it's not enough just to know about Jesus or to hear the story, not enough just to nod your head. I, I teach the mm-hmm. illustration in the book that is, that's like me. I'm, I'm flying out on Monday to go teach in Louisiana. Well, it's not enough for me to believe airplanes fly. It's not even enough to hang out at the terminal at the airport. I have to climb on board. And so that's where we get to salvation and say, you need to know about Jesus. You need to believe in Jesus, but you need to climb on board with Jesus. You need to ask him to be your forgiver and your leader to, you know, give you his salvation, to apply his death on the cross, that payment to your sins. And basically, it's the great exchange. You give him your sins, he gives you his righteousness. Mm. And if you do that, and that's the point I was getting to with my hair gal yesterday uh, after the haircut. I just said, it's you know, we, we talk about this stuff, but don't get the wrong idea. This isn't just about understanding more. It's not about just reforming your behaviors. It's mm-hmm. about reaching a point where you have a spiritual birth because you, you realize I'm dead. I need forgiveness. I need salvation. So the salvation message is part of it, but we need to put it in that broader context. And I think it's chapter eight where I really explain that in more detail. And then I give a bunch of practical illustrations that really help get to the point when you have a shorter time, you don't have time to go into great depth. I I still believe in having, you know, quicker, easier ways to convey it. Yeah, that's great. All right. Well, this has been a great conversation, Mark, and our time has flown. And uh, before we go, I want you to just tell our listeners where they might be able to find the resources for the Contagious Faith book. Of course, we'll link to these in the show notes for those who are listening. But tell us a bit about the six-week training course and what that entails. Yeah. Well, first, just the question of where to get these materials, Christian bookstores, um, Amazon, uh, christianbook.com. Uh, Barnes and Noble, they they all have this. Um, but I also want to mention we the publisher has a website that uh, where there's discounts for quantities and really cool on this website. There's a little uh, questionnaire you can do on your smartphone to help take a, this questionnaire and, and 
you know, kind of test what your style is. So maybe you're hearing this and going, I'm not really sure. Well, here's the website. It's uh, contagiousfaithbook.com. So it's just the title of the book, contagiousfaithbook.com. There's the questionnaire there, and then you can also order the book uh, or the training course. And just briefly, the training course is a, it's the same material, uh, but in a small group discussion format. It's a six-week curriculum, and I have videos, like 20-minute videos for each of the six weeks, where I talk about the material uh, illustrated. I tell some stories that aren't in the book, you know, on the videos. And I do interviews where I talk to people who, you know, model or are great examples of these different styles. So I interview Lee Strobel about the story sharing style or mm-hmm. Elisa Childers talking about the uh, reason giving style and Greg Steer, a real hard hitting evangelist uh, who started the ministry Dare to Share. I interview him about the truth telling style and so forth. So uh, that's for small groups or classes at churches. Uh, You could do it just as a, you know, a a couple of you could do it together, but uh, that training course really helps you flesh out these ideas and try some of the ideas, try some of the skills in the context of community where you can get encouragement. So I hope people will check those out. I, I, I think it can really be liberating uh, especially if you're afraid of this, I think this will help lower those barriers, and I hope unleash a whole bunch more of us to share our faith. Amen. And uh, you know, maybe there are small groups out there who are looking for you know what they're going to be doing next, and, and maybe themes that they want to cover. This might be a great resource for that as well. So we'll point people to that in the show notes. And again, Mark, it was a pleasure reading your book. Uh, very enjoyable Indeed. and challenging and uh, great to have you on and talk about it and wishing you all the best with the Strobel Center and everything you're doing there at uh, the university. Well, thanks so much, Brian. Thanks for your pioneering work, especially online with apologetics. And just I appreciate you and all you guys are doing and my new friend, Chad. So thanks, you guys. Yes, it was nice to meet you. You too. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you have a question you'd like us to address or just a message for us, feedback, good or bad, you can either email us at podcast at apologetics315.com or leave a voice message for us using SpeakPipe. Just go to speakpipe.com slash apologetics315 to leave us a message. And remember, if you include a Ghostbusters quote in your question, we guarantee that we'll read it on the podcast. We also ensure up to 50% better quality answers. Also, if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave a review in iTunes or the podcast platform of your choice, and please share this episode with a friend if you found it useful. Remember, you can find lots of apologetics resources at apologetics315.com, along with show notes for today's episode. Find Chad's apologetics stuff over at Truth Bomb Apologetics. That's truthbomb.blogspot.com. This has been Brian Auten and Chad Gross for the Apologetics 315 podcast, and thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.